Okay, so uh, welcome back everyone. So uh, let me take you through today's agenda for my presentation. Uh, I'll start with a brief introduction of the topic, followed by the aim and objectives. The literature review, hypothesis, methodology, results and discussion, and finally the conclusion and recommendations. So before starting, just uh, a food for thought. The classrooms of our past are now, you can say, not the same as the classrooms of today or the classrooms of our future in the higher education. Now, due to the pandemic, okay, the online learning was the right option to guarantee the continuity of educational activities throughout that period. The conventional method was replaced by online learning and the biggest challenge in teaching and learning was the online learning from home program. Both the academics and the students were not familiar with the utilization of digital tools in their learning activities. On the other hand, online learning provided students with a better alternative to traditional learning as they could learn anytime and anywhere. However, learners were aware that their educational obligation relied more on themselves rather than their lecturers. The self-directed learning ensures a, mi a mixture of methods by which an individual is responsible for his or her own learning. On the same wavelength, the switch from the usual learning methods to studying online also influenced the motivation of the students to learn. So the aims and objectives of the study, the aim of this research is to explore how undergraduate learners self-directed learning abilities and motivations change when learning online amid the problems and limitations of online learning. The objectives, firstly, to establish whether SDL skills of undergraduate students in an online learning environment differs in accordance with the gender, different universities they are learning and the study fields they have chosen. To determine whether the motivation to study online differs in accordance with their gender, different universities and the study fields. And finally, to ascertain the association between the SDL and the motivation to study among the undergraduate students. Can the students' SDL abilities significantly predict their motivation to learn in an online environment? So the online learning uh, refers to the online study in the delivery of virtual education using the help of any such applications as a tool to convey learning. Now, during the COVID-19 pandemic, several public HEIs in emerging economies could not get hold of well-organized LMS to facilitate the online learning. So we had to adapt. In an online environment, the important role of the learner's self-regulation, motivation, and active learning inclinations have been emphasized because the students, the learners were on their own. On the other hand, the self-directed learning is learning in which the conceptualization, design, conduct, and evaluation of a learning project are directed by the learner. So they have a hold, a control on their own learning. So even Desi and Ryan have in their research revealed that SDL is an important learning activity which is self-regulated by the student. There is a firm connection between the use of technology and directed learning. Apart from the use of technology for learning to be successful, the student motivation is also very important. One of the student's individual learning characteristic is student motivation. So motivation to study consists of both internal and external support to learners who are studying in order to be able to change 
to, to, to adopt changes in their actions. The SDL is greatly associated with motivation to learn. Therefore, an absence of motivation happens to be a vital element for low educational performances. Now, this pandemic forced students to adopt online learning as a means of ensuring the continuation of their study. Hence, the online learning allowed students to participate in classes from anywhere in the world, provided they had a computer or internet connection. They have continuous access to lectures, course materials, and class discussion. However, the time for students to study at home were longer and they tend to be bored. Using the internet for learning extensively affects students' motivation to learn. For students to successfully participate in an online program, they must be well organized, self-directed, motivated, and possess a high degree of time management skills in order to keep up with the pace of the course and engage with their uh, lecturers. Studies have revealed that learners with learning motivation keep on perceiving learning as enjoyable and crucial for them. Hence, for online learning to be successful, motivation of students is required. Likewise, it has also become important to understand how SDL influences the motivation of learners in an online uh, environment. So these are the hypotheses devised for the research. So firstly, the significance, uh, the significant variation is present between the learners SDL abilities and gender. Secondly, the uh, significant variation is present between learners motivation and gender. Significant variation is present between learners SDL abilities and the universities they are learning. Similarly, uh, the significant variation is present between the learner's motivation and the university they are studying. There is significant variation between the learner's SDL abilities and their field of studies. And similarly, this, there is significant variation between the learner's motivation and their field of study. SDL abilities positively correlates with learning motivation in an online learning environment. And finally, SDL abilities would positively predict students' motivation for online learning. The methodology used for this research, okay, uh, a structured uh, survey questionnaire intended to collect quantitative data, leaving some room for a few open-ended questions to collect qualitative data as well. The self-administered questionnaires were set on the Google form. They were distributed across social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp, where students were more present. Additionally, questionnaires were sent by email. The population for the study comprises of learners pursuing an undergraduate course in the merchant public universities. A sample of 500 students were chosen using the convenient sampling method and uh, a, a response rate of 84% were received. Data analysis were mainly um, uh, done on the SPSS for both descriptive and inferential. The qualitative, qualitative open-ended comments were analyzed using thematic analysis. So the distribution of the students. So the four TEIs in Mauritius were concerned. So we had a response rate uh, from uh, the Open University of 21.6%, University de Mascarene 16.6%, University of Mauritius 28.9%, and the University of Technology Mauritius 32.9%. It was observed that out of the 422 respondents, 20% were from applied sciences, 33% were from engineering field, 5% were 
were from medical field, whereas the remaining 42% were from the social science field. Exploring the students' adoption of SDL and motivation in an online learning environment, it was noted that 61.37% uh, female students and 38.63 male learners were comfortable with SDL. A sample t-test ascertained that SDL was more engaging to female students as compared to the male students. A t-test established that gender and motivation are statistically significant. And it was noted that female students were more motivated compared to the male students. Exploring if a significant relationship exists amid the universities regarding SDL skills and motivation to learn, the chi-square test gives uh, uh, a p-value of 0 0.00, uh, showing that a statistically significant association exists. Likewise, the chi-square test generates the p-value that equals to 0, 0.00, specifying that statistically significant association exists amid universities and the students' motivation for online learning. Now, exploring whether SDL and motivation vary based on the field of study. So, it was concluded that there is statistically reliance amid the two variables explored. Even the students hold a statistically significant influence on their motivation for online learning. However, students' SDL skills diverge considerably according to their field of study. Medical students, applied sciences, and then engineering students had the lower most SDL skills results. To predict the association between the SDL and motivation to learn in an online learning environment, a Pearson correlation test was conducted. And it was established that there is a positive correlation between SDL and motivation. Since it, was, it has been established that SDL and motivation for online learning have a positive relationship, it became important to test the association between these two components in the online learning. It became now important to test the association and it was noticed that the components of SDL had a significant level uh, less than 0 0.05, which proved that components of SDL, especially learning in general, planning and implementation, self-monitoring and communication, significantly predict the motivation of students for learning online. The most important so predictor... You have, you have two minutes. Two minutes yeah. left. Okay. Predictors of motivation were planning and implementation and self-monitoring. So the conclusion first of all show a positive and significant relationship exists between the undergraduate uh, students SDL and motivation. Secondly, the result uh, of the study revealed that in an online learning environment, the female learners were having considerably higher SDL abilities and motivation to study as compared to the male. Students SDL skills and motivation are significantly affected by the universities where they were studying. The institution practices helped to develop the students SDL skills, which in turn motivated them to study online. So it would be valuable to create more activities that would develop the students SDL abilities. The realization of higher SDL skills among undergraduate students, their views were required to at least devise uh, new ways and also to recognize their learning needs while designing the learning objectives. And universities need to devise different learning approaches in order to encourage students to observe and assess their own learning uh, in the new learning environment. Thank you. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much, Chair, for the opportunity to uh, conduct this presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my topic is on GitHub, as has been uh, explained. Now, the background to this is uh, I've been at UKZN for about 10 years now, and I've always been passionate about uh, giving students a relative uh, 
uh, you know, education that is relative to, to what is uh, expected of them in industry. And it's quite a difficult exercise to do that because as you know, in the IT space, things are always changing. And uh, at times you're criticized for not adapting fast enough. And the name of the game is if you don't adapt quickly enough, uh, you've got competitors out there and we are competing for the best students amongst ourselves as universities. So we always want to stand out as uh, giving a curriculum that is relevant and uh, giving students that are marketable and employable uh, to uh, prospective employers. Uh, so from the several annual reviews that I do of my courses, you know, there's always uh, technologies that students always speak about to say, could we have this? And as well from our alumni, when they get out into the real working world, they, they send us some feedback. And one of the hot areas that, that stood out was, 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 was GitHub. Uh, so I took it upon myself, you know, to say, let me try and see how I'm going to incorporate this into a course. And, uh, you know, I just started doing what I thought would be appropriate. And then it dawned on me to say, perhaps let me try and see, you know, if anybody else has done this, if there's existing work on this. And to my surprise, I did find that uh, there was, you know, significant uh, uh, research into this area, significant, uh, you know, initiatives to incorporate this, even to, understand the pedagogical aspects of this to, to, to teaching and learning. So that's a way of introduction. Uh, the outline of my presentation, I'm going to talk about the objectives. I'm just going to give a brief introduction of what GitHub is. And of course, uh, what we do as academics, we try and prepare students for the industry. So if we are creating a product, we need to know about our consumer uh, and then align ourselves to, to, to that. And then we're going to look at uh, the educational aspects as informed by, by literature. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about some experiences that I've had uh, in utilizing uh, GitHub myself. Okay, so in terms of what I'd like to achieve today, uh, firstly, I'd just like to raise awareness in terms of the importance of integrating what's relevant to industry in computer science education. Uh, because at times we can be criticized as being overly theoretical, uh, but it's important that we don't lose sight of the core concepts, you know, that are foundational to, to computer science. And I believe this is relevant to, to any other field. You want to remain uh, relevant, but you also want to maintain that the uh, theoretical foundations are still uh, re respected. And then, uh, obviously, I'd like to, you know, not just talk about it, I'd like to just describe so that you have, a, a, for those who may not be familiar, you have a general understanding of what GitHub is, perhaps you can also consider trying to adopt it. Okay, and then we'll look at some of the pedagogical aspects of, of GitHub, how it can be beneficial, some of the disadvantages to it as well. Uh, and then lastly, as I've said, I will have a look at uh, my own experiences. So firstly, what is GitHub? Uh, so it's there's, there's basically two parts to it. Uh, there's a version control aspect, which is simply a means by which to manage change. Uh, this is particularly relevant to text documents, any document that you continuously edit and you would like to have snapshots of it such that at any point, if you make a mistake and you'd like to roll back to a previous version, uh, you can be able to actually do that. So it's a more sophisticated way of what you'd call an undo button in, in Microsoft uh, Word. So there's a version control side of things. And uh, from a quality assurance perspective, this is part of best practice in software development. Uh, as you all know that uh, we've moved a long way with our operating systems and each one of them have got a name. Uh, so, for example, Windows 10, at some point we had Windows XP and so forth and so on. Each of those had a version to it. And that version is informed by different bugs that come out, different updates, you know, so they have to keep track of those and manage them in a, in a proper way. So whatever text document there is, uh, if it's to be managed, whether it's a web page, whether it's a, a software code uh, document, uh, it's important to have versions uh, associated with it uh, so that we can have a fallback mechanism. Then there's a the hub side of things uh, because software development in essence is a team effort. 
you know, it's a collaborative effort. So this is like a, a social network in which uh, people can dialogue around code and share ideas. Uh, so it enables flexible work, which is very, very relevant in these days of remote working. Uh, basically, it promotes you to be able to work from different devices, uh, whether it's online or, or offline. So basically, it always downloads everything that you need, such that should you ever be offline, you can continue working. When you reach connectivity again, you can push everything uh, that you've worked on onto a central repository. So it's a nice way of blending that home and work experience. Uh, but obviously it's dependent on good uh, connectivity in, in infrastructure, particularly when you're dealing with uh, heavy uh, doc documents. Okay, uh, it's come a long way. So at the moment, it's very well integrated with uh, many uh, tools out there like IDEs, you know, platforms that allow for a full life cycle of software development. Uh, you know, e.g. Uh, Travis CI, which will allow you to go all the way from the inception of code all the way to its testing in a fully automated way. Now, there's basically options available. Uh, on this hub, you know, you don't just have an ability to collaborate, but you've also got an ability to store documents in a central repository. That repository can either be private or it can be public. And obviously, the private one is paid. And uh, over here, I've got examples of what the pricing looks like. Uh, so if you'd like to have a, a, a private one, so at the very least, you're going to be paying about $4 per user. Now you can see that for an established company, that's not too much to ask for in terms of you know, the expected benefits that would come about from, from that. Now there's a disadvantage in that generally GitHub has got a very steep learning curve, you know, so it's got its own jargon. So as a result of that, there can be a slow uptake to it. But nonetheless, it is gaining ground. Okay, and then let's have a look at how industry typically makes use of, of GitHub. You know, they mainly use it around open source, uh, and that's the whole philosophy behind GitHub. They saw a niche that there's lots of open source code out there. It's not well managed. It's supposed to be publicly available. And how can people contribute to it? So they created this repository and then saw a niche to say, okay, we can also privatize it and make some income around it. So it's mainly used by companies that do have the financial ability to be able to pay those uh, fees to uh, uh, have private repositories and it's generally a team effort so you wouldn't generally see it with an individual software developer you'd see it with companies that have about 10 or more uh, um, individuals working in their team as I've mentioned before very flexible so ideal for a remote working uh, it supports the full software development life cycle all the way from planning to testing deployment it's also got ability to customize the available tools. So you can create your own functionality with the APIs, and the various apps that are there. And it's not a single player in there. There's other competitors like GitHub and uh, Bitbucket, but generally there's, uh, there is an agreement in terms of who's the leading player, uh, uh, but the, the, the general uh, direction is that uh, GitHub has got uh, the huge majority of the uh, market. And then finally, on that point, uh, GitHub itself does some self-reflection. And I've got an interesting snapshot here. They've got an annual report that they call the state of the art, the state of the Octoverse, Octoverse report, basically the state of the use of GitHub. So this snapshot here is coming from the 2000, uh, 2021 report. And there's an interesting insight there to say they, they analyzed basically the use of documentation uh, within the diff different repositories. And you can see the blue there is not what we would expect. You know, generally, whichever category you're looking at, you can see that the general practice is that people are not putting guidelines, they're just going straight into, in, in, into, into coding. So from a teaching perspective, you can see that there's a lot of people coming out of universities that have been well-grounded in terms of uh, best practice of uh, doc documentation. And then uh, uh, moving on to the actual pedagogical aspect, so I've reviewed five uh, different papers that are talking about this. Uh, this is an initial study. There's a lot more papers, 
generally the, the topics that are available in terms of what GitHub is typically used for is, is basically either admin or either the actual uh, uh, teaching and learning uh, uh, activities. From an admin perspective, it's important to have a learning management system. Uh, so it can be used as that, your equivalent of Moodle, but it cannot compare to Moodle because it's got limited functionality. Its advantages is that it will give you an ability to store very big repositories uh, in some institutions to be able to have a, a Moodle, for example, that will support huge uh, 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 projects. It, it's very difficult. So migrating to, to GitHub can be an advantage in that regard. Also, it's important, uh, you know, in terms of monitoring student engagement, you know, because everything's logged, you can have a very good idea of how students are engaging. You can generate qualitative and quantitative indicators, and some of these can be incorporated into the assessment criteria. However, there's a disadvantage there, which is that uh, high activity doesn't necessarily translate into uh, understanding and into um, uh, good grades. And then in terms of the pedagogical side of things, uh, some researchers have found that uh, it's a very ideal way of preparing students for the working community. And uh, a disadvantage there is that it creates extra work for instructors because now they have to work with a new tool and uh, they have to prepare extra resources. And then collaboration is very important in terms of teaching and learning. There's room for uh, continuous feedback, but along with that, there's a concern of privacy because everything is now visible amongst uh, the classes. So everyone can see what the other student is, is actually doing. And that can be a concern in some cases. Then lastly, in terms of assessment, it offers huge opportunities for automation, scalability, and also peer assessment. Uh, but however, because it's still it's in its developmental phases, we find that the diversity in terms of uh, the types of assessment that are available is limited. And then uh, in terms of my own experiences, uh, uh, basically, as I've said, uh, uh, you know, it, it is possible to, to use GitHub and GitHub has been learning from the advice that they've been given. And the predominant advice that's been coming through is that the pedagogical aspects are very limited. So they've gone out of the way, created a new initiative called GitHub Classroom. Uh, this is a fully fledged GitHub you know, facility that is available free of charge to educational institutions. So basically students get a GitHub experience for free uh, while doing their assessments. And in their own words, the GitHub uh, classroom team says that uh, they automate your course and you focus on the teaching. So they're trying to take away the administrative side of things. Good news is free. Uh, all you have to do is uh, validate yourself as, a, as an academic. There's a accreditation process there where they just verify that you are who you are you're saying. Uh, the process is very simple. All you have to do is have a GitHub account, create an organization, and then add a classroom, create an assignment, and then send students your links, and it's possible to actually automatically create those assignments. Then from my own experience, this is uh, something that I did this year. This is just screenshots. Unfortunately, I couldn't share uh, actual students' work. Uh, so for an uh, assignment, I added myself as a user and I'll test this. So this is an actual assignment for the sake of privacy. I didn't include actual student names there. I only included my own assignment submission that I did. So you can see there's a grade there. You can see there's actually a repository there. You can view the actual tests. Uh, so this was an actual assignment and you can see some of the feedback that I got from students uh, quite excited to say that, uh, you know, they've gained uh, industry experience. Then, in summary, colleagues, uh, from the literature that's available, it seems that there is indeed a wide body of knowledge in terms of the use of GitHub in computer science education. There's a general consensus that there's still room for improvement in terms of enhancing its, 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 its uh, capabilities. Uh, but GitHub is responding to that. Uh, it has created an initiative called GitHub Classroom that's available for free. And generally, uh, even other researchers concur that students appreciate you know, that extra advantage that they have going into industry. However, I believe there's room for uh, improvement in terms of the promotion of GitHub uh, through platforms like this, just to encourage more people just to come on board uh, and just simplify that steep learning curve. The more we talk about it, the more it will be simplified. 
uh, within this work, I made use of some references that you may have seen in the previous slides and for the sake of acknowledging them, that will be the last slide that I will put up. Chair, I thank you as well in my presentation. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Just for those um, uh, attendees that uh, were, were not in South Africa, just to take you back then, and, and for those who were with us during that time, uh, cast your mind back to the 15th of March when President Ramaphosa declared the national state of disaster. And uh, following that, um, on the 16th of March, all post-school education institutions were untimely uh, put to recess. You recall that um, the health minister confirmed the first known patient being a male citizen around the 5th of March. Um, and I'm gonna take you through then levels that then followed. In May, level four kicked in and specifically focusing on the students, we had to do some control here and we only focused on final year students in programs requiring clinical training um, were then allowed to, to come back. You, you recall that certain institutions are offering such programs. Level three kicked in around June, July, and um, students' population, not over 33%, could come back to the campus or the delivery sites and residence and on, on conditions, of course. Your postgraduates and final year students were also allowed to come in. And I'm focusing on the population of the students here so that you can understand their frustrations during this time. In August, level two kicked in, um, and that meant that the population of 60% could return to campus for teaching, learning, um, and, and so forth. The first year students for the very first time could then return as well um, around August. In September of 2020, we then had the 100% of students' population allowed to come back to, to campus. Colleagues, that is a, a bridged higher education COVID line timeline for year 2020. And the reason I'm mentioning that, I want you to understand some of the challenges then that come into play. The first one is just access to infrastructure. Those students who are at home might not have Wi-Fi. They might not have data. They might not have computers. They didn't have access to the, to, to the library. The online teaching had to be arranged for most programs. Uh, many institutions were not ready. The assessment submission dates had, had to be rescheduled uh, because of the timeline that I've just shown you in the previous slide. Then of course, the amendments had to be made to assessment strategy and institutional policies um, across the board. Um, some institutions, for example, offered boot camps for those students who could not participate in online teaching. Uh, colleagues, the teaching and learning could not be completed at some modules um, requiring access to laboratories, for example. All um, uh, higher education institutions needed to keep student numbers very low on campus. And all this had an impact um, in how we do things. Because of time constraints, I will then focus on some of the plans that were adopted by uh, the private higher education institutions. The first one was the take home assessments, which were relatively done by as a means of tools by many higher education institutions. If you read the work of Bengston, um, he argues that uh, um, the, the, the preferred choice of assessment method of higher uh, tax taxonomy levels is uh, take home assessment because they promote that higher order thinking skills. If you look at TAM's work as well, um, they argue that the, the take home exams offer the opportunities for students to work at their own pace at a given time, of course, to answer the exam in the comfort of their homes. And I want you to under, uh, underline the comfort of their homes because that's an assumption because if you look at the thousand um, hemisphere, particularly in South Africa, there's no such thing as a comfort of their homes for many of our learners. Uh, with open access to all resources, including notes, books, and the internet. Again, there's a digital divide if you look at Southern Africa with regards to those resources. Rich in 2011 concluded that the student survey revealed that students believe they learned more and studied harder when tests were take home assessments. 
you have to agree that it could be an ideal tool to use during this historic um, challenge that we are facing. And the, the, the sample then that I would like to share with you, uh, and you can read more on the paper, is how we took, for example, programming modules and we converted them to a new structure uh, where, for example, if it was a test, it was then sent as a take-home test. If it was a written answer in exam, it was changed to a take-home exam. And I'm focusing on only two modules because of the presentation of today, which is programming 1A as well as applied programming. Colleagues, this then meant that if it was a written answer in exam, um, what are we gonna do to change it to a new structure? We needed to include additional instructions. We needed to ensure that students can upload. If they cannot upload, how do they then submit this, this, this document, taking into account that historical abridged timeline that I showed you? Uh, we had to think about ways of how do we convert this to a theory base, more like um, multiple choice questions, debugging, short questions, um, writing short Java code, and explaining and discussing, of course. All this at the back end, we wanted to look at what is happening with the results. So our enterprise data warehouse is got four components. It is structured repositories that we collect data and consolidate all the data of an organization into the process of delivering data uh, to our users so that they, you can present this in more like dashboard form. Obviously, the descriptive analytics are used here. In other words, what happened or is happening now. So it was easier to understand and analyze descriptive models, of course, if you look at the work of Gongola and Selis. The diagnostic analysis helps us to answer the question, how it happened or why something is happening. And of course, as I said, we present this uh, to our lecturers or any users of the system in a user-centered design where the module results are presented using customized dashboards based on the UCD. The, the dashboards have that advantage of providing lots of visualization components. And um, uh, because of time constraints, colleagues, let me conclude and say to you, when we did the, 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 the work, we noticed, and again, this is work in progress, we noticed that the assumption, of course, was that if, if one would give students take-home exams, in your mind, you're thinking this is going to be easy for them. Our results show that, sadly, that was not the case. For example, changing an assessment structure from test to take-home test did not result higher success rates. And if you look at our paper, you'll see the supporting um, evidence there, where you say, even the conclusion of Benson, that says, there's still a proportion of research absent concerning our take-home um, exams. The extended deadlines for submission, particularly for portfolios and project-based modules, also did not yield any success rates at all when it comes to um, this tool of taking home um, exams. It is clear to us that the most dominating lesson learned from COVID-19 colleagues is that education must be equal. At the moment, it is not. It is unequal, particularly in South Africa, um, including higher education for that matter. It is therefore fundamental that we need to track performance to improve and promote student success. We need to conduct any student intervention. We need to take into account students' concerns we need to identify potential risks that can determine the appropriate course of action that needs to be taken. I think we need to increase the urgency on the integration of technology into teaching and learning, particularly for online teaching. It goes without saying that we need to refine our policies for flexibility. And if you look at the work of Jacobs, um, they argue that they, you need to reduce the stress on students during the stressful times, and you need to change the assessment strategy and approaches, taking into account the pros and cons of take-home exams. The way forward is important for us to collect data through observation surveys and interviews. We need to answer um, the, the question, 
are the number of assessments opportunities making any difference to these learners? The third study that could be uh, done is how, how ready are our students in transitioning to online teaching, considering the circumstances the students and lecturers face in South Africa in the presence of COVID. With that colleagues, and because of time, I would like to thank you for giving me your attention in listening um, at the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good uh, morning, uh, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Benson. Uh, I'm presenting this with uh, fellow presenters, uh, Dr. Rizan Masengu and Lucia Mandongwe. Uh, our topic is application of dig digital technologies in the 21st century. Uh, this uh, literature review of experiences, opportunities, and challenges in higher education. I think yesterday a person was asking about what actually is uh, in the 21st century. So it's quite interesting. We, we, when we talk of 21st century, uh, looking at um, the critical thinkers, those who are innovators and uh, uh, moving forward from the traditional maybe kind of. So here, the, the introduction of our topic here, the realignment of investment in technology and business models to engage di digital customers more effectively at every touch point in the customer experience lifestyle. So you look at um, higher education institutions, the customers of higher education uh, institutions are students. So you would find that when you think of uh, digital technology, you need to think of these uh, students. So companies need to think of digital technology as a formal effort to renovate business vision models and investment. Now, even given the visions that you would find maybe institutions had five years ago, the disruption that we are seeing as a result of the pandemic, I think that has even made us to relook at our visions, even our models of delivery, and even our investments in terms of the infrastructure. So that's how uh, these sources have been saying like, digital business transformation can be defined as the modification of business processes, procedures, capabilities, and policies to take advantage of the changes, opportunities uh, presented by new digital technologies. Yes, we need to look at what are the uh, opportunities that are even uh, presented by even this challenge. Yes, we have a I normally use the word challenge more than the word problem because I look at a challenge as something that has got a solution more than a problem that I see as something that is, I mean, you don't have even a foreseeable solution to that. So digital technology has been in use for, for some time. And then uh, it has been used in, like in ordinary life, on online shopping uh, and even uh, online digital materials there where we even find such things like finding directions is the use of digital technology. Now, how do we use that in education sector? Because this also has not been left out. We need to embrace that. So no explanation as to why digital technology works well in some cases and even fails in other uh, cases. So even um, now this is the, these were the objectives that we, we worked with to identify opportunities that are presented by di digital technologies in higher education institutions to establish challenges that are faced when using digital technologies as teaching and learning uh, tools. The, I think one of the challenges that like the previous pr presenter where the, the issue to do with the tech home examination is one of the things that we also experienced here in, in Omani to say, uh, just after the pandemic, we had to say, okay, instead of the physical examination, the final examination, uh, the summative, we need to give these students a tech home. And for how long? So initially we gave them like 48 hours, we would give them a question and then they were supposed to, then answer that and uh, give feedback uh, on a platform within 
48 hours. So those are again, where some of the uh, challenges uh, and the experiences, right? So establishing methods of implementing uh, digital technologies at the most cost effective. And now you would find the methods of implementing, like in the case of our institution, we had to start by uh, conscientizing or uh, letting the instructors know first of all, the, the tools that had to be used. And then that cascaded to, to the students as well, right? So you'd find uh, if you look at uh, digital technology, uh, I remember very well some years way back, we would have such things like uh, disks, that's were floppy disks, eight inch, three inch. We later moved on to um, the Walkman, uh, cassettes and so forth. Um, up to uh, maybe the, the current generation. So it's uh, something that is dynamic. Technology is something that is dynamic and it's not static. So if uh, we were also looking at this in literature, we came across um, a radar that they, uh, that they divide says the, um, these are the dimensions of digital technology. Um, from these dimensions, you can see there's teaching uh, and learning, uh, which has embraced a better degree uh, than other, other, other dimensions. You've got infrastructure, you require digital technology there, uh, the curriculum part of it, the administration, the research, you use digital technology, the human resources aspect, business process, uh, the information that you have, but the list, was uh, like in marketing. I don't know why, where you'd find maybe higher education institutions, they don't use much of uh, digital technology to market their programs and so forth. So I don't know why in that area. Now, we also uh, found out that uh, the pandemic now, uh, it made even these uh, uh, higher education institutions move to the use of digital technology uh, as a result of the uh, disruption. And that became an awakening for both the, the learners and the institutions to say, anytime anything can happen, we need to be very uh, much awake. And that uh, the, the use of what is mostly used in digital technology are mobile phones, computers, tablets, uh, and so forth, right? Uh, but there's also a claim that they are some cases where the intake is very low, but using uh, using a digital technology in higher education institutions is neither something that is an automatic guarantee when you use to say, uh, we are going to have our learners um, passing, we are going to have our learners being actively engaged, nor is it an assurance that uh, you will have them uh, succeeding or uh, uh, doing well. So it needs, so the use of uh, synchronized and asynchronized technologies have made it possible to collaborate and support the learning process being and brings discussion uh, and knowledge sharing. Redesigning of the learning space has been achieved that has seen physical laboratories for experiments being replaced by virtual ones. So that's something that we also came across to say, uh, there are some cases where physical laboratories, they they were now replaced by virtual ones and even the simulation-based laboratories. Now, the methodology that we used, we used the systematic literature review uh, and then we adopted the three pivotal activities there, the interpretivism, uh, content analysis, and uh, study, uh, the study period, we limited it to, uh, to a decade. Uh, data was uh, acquired through structured um, questionnaire and um, we also uh, used like the definitions that authors were, were using their remarks and then their findings as well as the scope of their what they were doing right so the results here we found out that digital technologies there is ideal as it has also gained prominence where it's, it can be used like in uh, conferences, distance learning, mobile phones, and uh, even the massive open uh, online courses, they can uh, use that. There are also opportunities that have been presented by 
digital technologies. That's what we also came across uh, because it has got also the excellent ability to save uh, costs in the long run. Yes, in the beginning, you would find that the implementation stage, you need to invest uh, both in infrastructure and even in training. Uh, say in like the, the instructors, they need to be trained. You need to invest the students. Also, you need to invest in their uh, training. And uh, it also requires less physical space when you then have implemented that. So that those are opportunities that are presented. But however, we also found out that there are some challenges like uh, hindrances may include high cost of infrastructure. Uh, you don't know how much it's going to uh, maybe uh, give you as a return. So that, that's, again, a, a challenge. Then the socioeconomic and te technological uh, conditions, uh, like the socioeconomic, where we found out that maybe in some areas we had some students who would complain that we are in very far places, we are not receiving um, uh, internet bandwidth that are uh, good, some could not even afford, like they were complaining initially about the, the gadgets to say, I don't have a computer. And all of a sudden I'm supposed to be uh, learning online. Uh, then also lack of systematic approach to teaching and learning where maybe even as instructors, we needed maybe to be monitored to see, are we doing it systematically or somebody's just recording something and then they upload and then they go then awareness, education, and attitudes towards the digital technology. It's also required. So it's a challenge uh, that is uh, maybe uh, in the hands of uh, admin. Then the technical and administrative uh, uh, support, is, that one is required. It's a challenge. Students would always maybe complain. We, we can't get this, more so like during the time of examinations even though the examinations were online, but still you had some uh, challenges, especially when the, when, the, when the load is too much, you'd find they, they would always complain. Staff development, both for teaching staff and then even the, the support, lack of expertise in the use of digital technology. Right, in conclusion, digital technology has had an impact on daily life, let alone the teaching and learning environment teaching and learning activities have been facilitated by such concepts as blended learning in which face-to-face -face interactions between the instructor and the learner uh, have been mixed with uh, the online. So uh, like even currently, that's what we have impressed here. We, uh, because of the lockdown that has been uh, reduced to level one, we are now doing uh, the face-to-face -face for the first years so that at least they familiarize with uh, the policies and everything of the institutions, right? It is also important for higher education institutions to identify technologies that are ideal for their specific learning needs. Uh, when uh, at one time I came across also literature that was saying, when you are uh, looking for technology to, to use, uh, you must look for technology that is suitable to your curriculum. Don't look for technology first, then you design your curriculum, but you have a curriculum and then it is now the technology that you now have to uh, make sure that it is aligned to the curriculum that you, you already have. And so those are the challenges. So thank you so much. Um, any questions that are Thanks very much. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the talks have been very practical. I'm not sure if this one is going to be practical, but um, it is uh, in the same way it is a, a rather philosophical and maybe at a sort of a meta level where the talk I gave yesterday on the Odell of formal methods is somewhat more uh, practical and somewhat more at an object level. Anyway, the, the title you've given there now, I'm glad to see Dr. Skuman is also online. She's my colleague here at, at UNISA. And UNISA is an ODEL, Open Distance E-Learning Environment. We thought we were, but when COVID struck, we realized there's lots of gaps that we had to address. Okay, so the lead author is Professor Hugo Lotri from the School of Computing. I'm sitting in a, in a business school, as you can see, but I used to be 
in a school of computing until about eight years ago. Okay, the, the outline, what are we going to be trying to talk about is introduction, the problem statement, research questions, conceptualizations, the research methodology, and then a literature review on Odell, very briefly, supervision frameworks, science of computing, problematization, then we're going to build a framework, and then the usual summary conclusions and future work. Okay, so um, the graduate supervision of m and students in computing has unique challenges. I'm not sure if you can see the word unique there. Let me just move this one. But anybody will say, well, my subject is also unique. Physics will say the same, chemistry will say the same, and so on. But anyway, the, the issue we're sitting with in computing is there's a diversity of graduate students. Um, there's computer science, there's information systems, and with the merger of the institutions in 2002 by Professor Kader Asmal, we have information technology that was bunched together. So now we have three groupings. And of course, the field advances so rapidly. I remember what a great operating systems person, Professor Ed Kaufman, said to me in 2002. Yes. No, 1992, he said to me, you know, young man, if you can see your whole education in computer science wiped out within a decade. Now, it's probably five years now, not a decade anymore. Okay, and then there's often laboratory work, programming, and so on. And if you look at the formal methods component where you have verifiable software and discrete mathematics and so on, if you supervise students in that area, that Odell complicates things a lot. Okay, so well, what we want to do, we want to generate or define a conceptual and a very generic problematization framework. And we'll come to what these things are. Okay, so the problem statement, I've already covered most of it. Uh, computing is fragmented. To the best of the knowledge of us, there is no framework that can be used to provide a fuller and more connected view of the nature of these fragmentations within the subject. So we're going to look at it from an intersection of three things. Odell, postgraduate supervision and computing research, the parts there in yellow. Um, and allowing for existing knowledge in the field, different assumptions, and this is very important, and then schools of thought. So what this looks like, and these are, this is a Venn diagram. My, from my former life, I used to work with a lot of these things. So we want to work at the intersection of where these things are, Odell, postgraduate supervision, and computing research. Okay, so the research questions are, what are the problematization aspects with respect to these things? And the second research question, what kind of framework can we come up with? Now, I usually say to my students, this is not an, a question. This is an objective. You want to build a framework, that's an objective. But owing to the uh, conceptualness of our framework and the high level nature, as you will see, we decided to make this a research question. So um, our underlying assumptions are that science is social. Now, scientists are not social people but never mind. But we work in different communities of practice, the COPs. And we're going to look at paradigms and metaphors. And then at the bottom of that, we're going to look at the things that are probably more familiar to all of us. Okay. So my research methodology is basically following Saunders et al's research onion, which we're all familiar with. So the philosophy is interpretivist. The approach is inductive. We're going to build something. Choice qualitative at this stage, strategy, literature. The time horizon is called cross-section. And this ties up with the question that I asked to the previous speaker. The literature that we looked at is over a long time, but we did the looking thereof, we did it in a short space of time. So I would say it is cross-sectional. And the data uh, collection, not yet, but only through literature. All right. Um, so we're going to build on the traditional theories of the, of the classical learning, like behaviorism, cognitivism, constructivism. Now, please don't ask me what all those things are. If I have to go and look it up, if you ask me, I've got it printed here, but let's assume that is given. And then we look at Odell, open distance e-learning as industrial action. It's not strikes, it's something else. Transactional distance, I think uh, Dr. Schumann spoke about that yesterday and the systems view of Odell. And then we're going to try and build a problematization framework. Previous speaker said the word challenge is better. Yes, I agree. But um, the terminology is problematization that relate to supervision at the distance. 
Okay, so most of these we've already done, but there are various frameworks of supervision. There's the apprenticeship one, which most of us do, you and a student, or you and a colleague and a student. But then there are others, the cohort supervision, the students sort of supervise each other at colloquias or colloquia. Project based, look at it as a project with milestones and return on investment after each part, the community of practice and the knowledge management idea. Okay. So um, we've already indicated the fragmentedness of the subject. But for example, one has got BSc students. We've got also BCom students, and these two are from different faculties. Then we also have service subjects that we offer to other faculties. UNISA faculty is called the uh, college. The field advances rapidly. There are also things that happen in the field like technology adoption issues, like the TAM, the UTAUTM, and uh, Ben Katesh's stuff, which he did. And often there are surveys that are being done in, in conjunction with very, very theoretical things that happen in computer science. Okay, just briefly on problematization, what we are saying is we look at it from the other side. We look at the things that we believe. Are that really true? All right. And here you can think in terms of um, politics and gender studies, how things have flipped around from what traditional people used to believe and which has now turned out to be completely incorrect. All right. So the essential idea is we unpack the challenges before we move to a solution. Now, there was an interesting study done by uh, two people, uh, Locke and Golden Biddle, way back 24 years ago. My son is now 24. That's why I remember that date. And they analyzed 82 publications that were published over 20 years. Now, they didn't do the study over 20 years, but the publications were. And they found that the, the literature do or does three things. They say existing literature or extant literature is incomplete or it's inadequate. It doesn't address what should be addressed. Apology for that. It's inconsumerable, means it's completely wrong. We need to, we need to redo these things. So we can do use these three categorizations to look at what we want to do. All right, then we also look at the work by, by Gareth Morgan, way back 1980, where he says at the top, you've got paradigms. That's where the government set that the side on certain things. Lower down, you have university management, for example, and down here, okay, those, those are the metaphors. And down here are the puzzle solving things, the things that we as lecturers do, the day-to-day the -day things. Okay, so maybe I can skip this slide, but I can just give you an example of a paradigm. Uh, many years ago, there was an investigation. They told UNISA, you should not offer postgraduate degrees. You should st stay undergraduate. So that was a paradigm a shift that was made, but we decided to stay as a postgraduate institution as well. The metaphors, um, what are the different learning realities, like what which post supervision style should be adopted and the puzzle solving having decided one what technicalities should you now address within this okay so here comes the framework the framework is built around the paradigms the metaphors and the activities which are the puzzle solving things it's in the form of a table um, so we broke it up into paradigms the three circles you saw the odell the supervision the computing research and there are all those theories which I said, please don't ask me about it, all right? We talk about the industrial activity and systems, but we forgot to add the transactional distance. So I added it in green in the paper, this is missing. And then you've got the apprenticeship ones, the community of practice, project-based things under the supervision. Okay, now you will say, but these are just questions. You just ask questions. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. We are questioning existing uh, constructs and structures. Coming to the puzzle solving part of the, the framework, I've just highlighted some things for IR stuff. Scaffolding, to what extent should you help students or leave them eventually? There's certain methodology courses they must take. Power relations between you and a student. All right. And then configurations of student systems. Okay, summary conclusions of future work. What did we do? We provided a three intersection view of Odell postgraduate stuff and uh, computer uh, supervision. Um, so there they are. Then we defined the three tier problematization framework uh, and we had the discussion. 
So the conclusions are, we believe that this three tiered approach that we have provides a holistic view of the problematization of postgraduate supervision in computing. Now it's important to note that our approach is opposite to what others do. Others take existing things and they build on it. We go from the other side and we take a skeptic approach and say, is what we are doing correct? Shouldn't this be done differently? Okay, and as you saw, most of the things were just questions. So it provides an identification of rich research that can be undertaken further in this area, which of course we will do. So future work would be among surveys, validate the framework through surveys. Now, where do you survey? If you go and ask supervisors things, they won't be honest with you. And they will say, ah, you want to use my info to write a paper. Now I want to write the paper myself. So there's a problem. We thought we could go to industry and ask employers who employ our students who've been through these processes, what they think about it. That's one possibility. And of course, many postgraduate research topics could follow from this framework. Okay, there's a multitude of references that we use. And thank you. That's all I have for you.